Hey guys, it's Miharu, and it's finally time to talk about the one, the only, my favorite game, Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon. This review has been an even longer time coming than the last, and the reason for that is not only because I specifically wanted it to coincide with the game's 20th anniversary, which is today, but also because this will be a double review, covering both the original game and the remake. There's a lot to go through, so let's get started. So, what's the story? Well, as the title implies, it's the Year of the Dragon, and Spyro, the Elders, and Hunter for some reason, are relaxing in the Dragon Realms with all the new eggs, which somehow exist despite there being no female dragons. Just then, a hooded figure pops out from a hole in the ground, and silently orders a team of rhino-looking enemies, called Rhinox, to steal all the eggs. She brings them back to the main villain, the Sorceress, who tells her to stop anyone from coming through the tunnels. Unbeknownst to them, they were being watched by Zoe, who promptly reports back to the dragons that the eggs were taken to the other side of the world, aka the Forgotten Worlds. Spyro and Hunter jump down one of the holes, and thus the adventure to rescue the baby dragons begins. Your abilities from the previous games remain. The basics like gliding, charging, flaming, and rolling, which was added to Reignited, and the learned moves like swimming, climbing, and head bashing. Power-ups also make a return. Superfly, Super Flame, Invincibility, and Supercharge, which thankfully is back to working how it did in Spyro 1. Absent are the Super Bounce, Plasma Bomb, or Acid Shot, and Super Freeze, though the latter makes an appearance in Frozen Altars as just standard Ice Breath. A new quote-unquote ability for Spyro in this game is, of course, skateboarding, which is utilized for various challenges and even something you can do for fun to earn points and set new records. It's a real shame that leaderboards weren't added to the Raid 9 version. The way Spyro controls is unchanged from Rikdo's Rage. However, the main gameplay gimmick for Spyro 3 is the addition of five extra playable characters. Sheila the Kangaroo, who specializes in high jumps, kicks, and stomps, Sergeant Bird the Penguin, who can fly and shoot missiles, Bentley the Yeti, who smashes things with his club, the blaster-wielding Agent 9 the Monkey, and even Sparks, who is apparently a master of projectile attacks. Just like in the last game, new abilities can be unlocked, but this time they're all for Sparks, and are learned after completing each of his personal levels. First is increased distance for gem collecting, second is the gem finder, third is an extra hit point, and fourth will allow him to break open gem baskets and warp directly to any level through the atlas. It's worth noting that the gem finder and warp are not rewarded to you in Reignited, as they are implemented by default across all three games. Besides gems, which are once again used as currency to pay money bags to free the playable critters, each with a funny cutscene after doing so, open doors, etc., your main focus will be collecting eggs, which function the same way orbs did. This is the only game in the trilogy to not feature a secondary collectible, or tertiary if you count gems. Much like Avalar with its seasonal homeworlds, the Forgotten Worlds are themed after times of day. Sunrise Spring, Midday Gardens, Evening Lake, and Midnight Mountain. Some levels will be open upon arrival, and the others will require the magic of a certain amount of dragon eggs to power them. Similar to the first game, Spyro 3 is back to having a fixed amount of levels within each world. Four regular, a critter home, and a speedway. Bosses act as midway points between worlds, and are reached by completing every level sends the speedway. As previously mentioned, Sparks now has his own levels as well, which are accessed after defeating each boss and must be completed in order. Additionally, egg challenges are now located within their own separate portals. Some will be done using Spyro as usual, and the others, marked by special signs, using one of the four critters. There are a total of five bosses in this game. Buzz, Spike, Scorch, and two fights with a sorceress. My favorite has always been Scorch. He's definitely one of the easier bosses in the game. All you have to do is shoot missiles at him as he flies around the arena. But it's still a lot of fun to replay, and plus, he just has a really cool design. As for the fight that made me rage, at least in the original, look no further than Spike. Just like Gulp, this guy was the bane of my existence as a kid. Not only did he always get those power-ups before me, but his attacks were always more effective, especially the blue one. I could never figure out how to outrun that laser, and I hated it. Luckily, just like with Gulp, I didn't find him nearly as difficult in Reignited. In fact, I had more trouble with Buzz. 
The interesting thing about bosses in this game is that we get a cutscene before each fight showing their origins. Each of them are regular Rhinox mutated by magic into huge monsters. Something I felt they were going for in the first game, but didn't quite come across. Something I've always loved about the original trilogy's soundtrack is how unique each of them are in their own way. You listen to a track and you immediately know which game it's from. And although Year of the Dragon's music is closer to Spyro 2 than 1, it still manages to have its own feel. This is largely due to the fact that Stuart Copeland did not go solo on this one, as he had help from a composer by the name of Ryan Beveridge. I'm not a music person, so unfortunately I can't go into detail about what exactly makes them sound different, so I'm gonna have you listen to a snippet of each game's music back to back so you can hear for yourself what exactly I mean. Defeating the Sorceress, your first reward comes in the form of getting revenge on Moneybags by chasing him down to get all your gems back. As a kid, I thought this was so funny and such a great way to top things off after all he's put you through. Your second reward for 100% completion is yet another bonus stage, called the Super Bonus Round. The best way I can describe it is a mix between the bonus stages in the previous two games. Your main focus will be collecting extra treasure like in the first one, minus the free flight, but you do so by playing a variety of mini games like Spyro 2. But while those ones, except for the roller coaster, were mostly relaxing and didn't require you do much, these ones are basically all challenges you've done before in the main game. Thief chasing, submarine shooting, yeti racing, and even a second fight with a sorceress that earns you a special egg in a true ending cutscene. Well, now that I've talked about everything that's in it, it's time for my personal thoughts. Why is this my favorite game? While there are many I have fond memories of, many better options by comparison, there's nothing quite like the feeling I get when I look at this game. See, though I am a 90s kid, I always consider the early 2000s to be the best time in my life, and Spyro 3, having been released in 2000, was the beginning of that. When I hold this game in my hands, I'm not only reminded of how much Spyro means to me, but everything else I had as a kid that I miss. Saturday morning cartoons on Kids WB, sleepovers with friends who used to live close by, Christmases that still felt magical. And that's why when I saw the first remade cutscene for the Reignited version, I did cry. Can you believe that? All this emotion over a game I've just recently completed. Oh, did I forget to mention that I only just 117%ed Spyro 3 a few weeks ago? Well, there's a couple reasons why I didn't before. First, it's for the sake of a nostalgic experience. As you can see, my copy here is indeed the Black Label version, but let me explain for those who don't know what I'm about to say. The original NTSC Black Label release is basically an unfinished version of the game. As such, it had issues including incorrect music in levels or boss fights, a missing cutscene, and the biggest one of all for me, not giving you eggs if you left a speedway and came back. So yeah. The game was withholding eggs from me, which left me unable to enter the super bonus round by normal means. Years later, after figuring out what happened, I found a cheat code which allowed me to finally access the super bonus round and attempt that awful, awful yeti race. Basically, that's what killed all enjoyment for me. That race is just so infuriating. And even though it's broken beyond belief and reignited, that's the only one I've actually won. Also, after seeing what would happen after I did win, I just didn't think it was worth it. And spoiler alert, it wasn't. That second boss fight with the sorceress was a complete joke. It was so easy. Easier than Scorch, even. And the ending cutscene is just not very cute, and it's kind of boring, and there's no dialogue. It's... I don't know. Again, just not worth it to me. But hey, I've at least platinum the reunited version, so that's something. Despite how I feel about the original, the remake actually ended up being my least favorite of the three. And no, it's not because Bianca's character arc wasn't done as well. 
Uh, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, please watch this analysis video I did about the change in Bianca's portrayal. So why exactly is it that I feel this way? The remake did a lot of things right. It went the greatest hits route and fixed the issues, it made Sergeant Bird and Agent 9 a lot easier and better to control, and just like the other two games, the level of detail for each world is incredible. Maybe it's because, due to it being the most rushed, some challenges became a buggy mess, resulting in something that felt even more unfinished than the original. And that one was already rushed. And don't even get me started on their little tweaks to the camera in certain missions. This was a problem that the second game had too in the Reignited version, but it's a lot more apparent here. It's weird because it actually makes some challenges easier, like the Nancy one for instance, which used to be top down, but some way harder, like Bentley's Whack-A-Mole. Though luckily you can manually change the perspective for that one. Stuff like destroying the Rhinoc Fortress and escorting the Fireflies as Sheila, though? Completely ruined by this change. Someone once asked me whether my opinion would be different if it just had the same cutscene music and voice acting. And while that was a major part of the charm, it wouldn't have worked by simply applying it to the new graphics. Bottom line is, remakes are remakes. They could be better, they could be worse. And even if the former is true, there will always be something, some kind of quality the original possesses that cannot be replaced. Perhaps I'll never fully complete the original Year of the Dragon, but that's okay, because to me, this is more than just a game. It's a time capsule, holding all my most precious memories that can resurface whenever I want them to. Thank you so much for watching, guys. This has been my longest and most important review yet, and I'm so glad I could share with you all how much this game means to me. As always, don't forget to subscribe and follow me on all my social medias, and I will see you next time. Until then, this is Miharu, signing off.